Welcome to a brand new episode in the Science and Technology Unleashed series. My name is Rahul Ramzanli and I will be your host for this episode. Molana Hazumab has said, My grandfather, Sir Sultan Mohammed Shah, was one of the pioneers of immunization in the 19th century, and the prevention of disease and public health have been major aims of our health services ever since. Our first guest is Dr. Nafisa Ismail, Associate Professor of the Psychology and Holder of the University Chair in Stress and Mental Health at the University of Ottawa. She obtained her PhD from Concordia University in 2009. She then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Massachusetts and joined the University of Ottawa in 2012. Her research expertise is in neuroimmunology and neuroendocrinology. She was recently awarded Young Researcher of Year by the University of Ottawa and Early Researcher Award by the Province of Ontario. She's also a member of the Global Young Academy. Yali Madat. My name is Nafisa Ismail. I'm an associate professor at the University of Ottawa, and I'm also the holder of the University Research Chair in Stress and Mental Health. I have always been passionate about the brain. Um, I would say that from what I recall, um, my, my greatest uh, interest in the brain began when I was in elementary school um, in grade six, and I did a project where I gave a presentation about the nervous system. And, and that's really when I realized that, yeah, I'm really passionate about knowing more about what the brain is about, how it controls each and every part of our body, all our organs. And then I decided to pursue the scientific field um, in high school, in college. And I did my undergraduate studies at Concordia University in Montreal, uh, where I pursued a bachelor's of science in psychology, but specialized in neuroscience. And there I got to volunteer in different research labs. Um, so I tried both uh, clinical psychology labs and neuroscience uh, labs. And that's when I realized that my true passion really lies in neuroscience research, where I can really get into these mechanisms in the brain that control a variety of behaviors that organisms engage in. My current research focuses on the impact of stress on mental health, especially during adolescence. The reason being is that most of the adult cases of mental illnesses like depression and anxiety that we see in adulthood actually began during adolescence. And we see that once um, children reach adolescence, girls become two times more likely to developing some of these mental illnesses like depression compared to boys. Um, but what are these factors that onset mental illnesses like depression during adolescence? Why are girls more susceptible uh, to developing some of these mental illnesses still remains to be investigated? Now, I am not saying that all stress is bad by any means. Um, acute stress, stress that we know has an end date. So for example, when we have a deadline, we have a work that we need to submit and we know that we are stressed during this time. Um, but once we submit this work, once we meet the deadline, the stress is going to be over. That kind of stress, acute stress, is actually good for us because it helps us focus, concentrate, and it motivates us to put all our efforts in completing this task that is so important and that we need to meet this deadline for. But the problem is when the stress doesn't end, when it's not an acute stress, when it's chronic stress, and that chronic stress is bad because there is no end date to it. So this chronic stress is this stress that we have to deal with on a daily basis that we have very little control over and that just remains in our life all the time and we're not too sure what we can do to end this stress. So the current COVID-19 pandemic is a very good example of a chronically stressful situation that so many people are exposed to. And there are many factors of stress during um, this current pandemic. One is the fear of getting the virus or, or the fear of, of having one of our family members getting infected. 
concerns about family members that would need our help, that would benefit from our visit, but that we're not able to visit and provide help to. Um, the whole measures that have been, all the measures that have been put in place by public health um, regulations, including the physical distancing, wearing the mask, while these are all important measures to keep us safe from the virus, they do come and change our way of doing almost everything that we've been doing so far. And it has impacted us in so many ways. And that is also a cause of stress. Uh, many families have also undergone economic issues. And so these financial problems also add another uh, factor of stress. And then the uncertainty. We don't know when exactly this pandemic is going to end. When are we going to actually be able to get vaccinated? We know that vaccine, vaccines are starting to roll out, but when we, will our turn come? When will everything return to normalcy? So these are all factors of stress, all this unknown, all these factors that we have no control over are a source of chronic stress. And what happens with chronic stress is that we experience these elevated, sustained level of stress hormone that we call cortisol. And when we face an acute stressor, cortisol comes up and down and everything's back normal in our body and we're back to homeostasis. But when we're experiencing chronic stress, cortisol remains elevated in our body. When it does so, it causes uh, both physical and uh, mental illnesses. And that's because cortisol in our body causes inflammation. And then we experience a lot of disorders associated with chronic inflammation. Um, but then this inflammation also enters our brain. It crosses the blood brain barrier and then causes neuroinflammation in the brain. Common changes that we see in the brain following chronic stress and elevated sustained levels of cortisol are a decrease in the volume of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is this region that is very important for memory and learning. And so we see that when we're experiencing intense levels of stress, we have a hard time memorizing, remembering things, learning new things. Um, it also decreases the volume of our prefrontal cortex. And with that, we are going to see um, difficulties concentrating on certain tasks, paying attention to important elements that we should be paying attention to. And then we will also see an increase in the amygdala. The amygdala is this brain region that is involved in the regulation of our emotions. And with an increase in volume in this area, we'll see that after chronic stress, we have trouble regulating our emotions where we are going to become irritable, uh, more angered than we should be in the situation that we're in. Um, we will see that in some ways we are going to behave very emotionally in certain situations when it is not really necessary. So the current pandemic is affecting everyone of all ages. We tend to focus on the adults and the older adults because yes, of course, they are experiencing many factors of stress. But we shouldn't forget that the children and the adolescents are also experiencing their fair shares of factors of stress. Um, and on top of that, also the stress from the adults, from the parents is also being transferred onto the children and adolescents. So we are concerned about the impact of the pandemic and all the factors of stress associated with it on the health of the children and adolescents. Um, the main reason being that during this period of development, the brain is extremely plastic. New neurons are continuously born. Um, we also see changes at the level of neurotransmitters, hormones, functioning of the brain. And we wanna make sure that the exposure to the current pandemic, to the stressor, is not going to have enduring implications or enduring impact on the brain of the children and the adolescents. More specifically, I'm thinking here of now maybe a increased vulnerability to mental illness later in life. So we want to try to do what we can to prevent uh, the onset of mental illness during such a critical age. And the best way to do that is to try to manage the stress level. 
Neuroscience is a growing field. There are still so many unknowns. If you're interested in the brain and how the brain controls the body, then this is definitely the right field for you. There is a lot of research to be done still to even understand basic concepts like memory formation, how are souvenirs there? How do we recall these stored souvenirs? These are all things neuroscientists don't understand yet. And adding to that, there is also what causes mental illnesses and neurodegenerative disorders. These are all still research that needs to be done, that we need to understand and investigate so that we can develop treatments that are going to be effective for mental illnesses and neurodegenerative disorders, because we know that these treatments are not yet available. There are some treatments, but they're not as effective as they should be and as effective as, effective as we would like them to be. And this is especially a problem given the aging population in our societies. So neuroscience is definitely a field where so much still needs to be discovered. How fascinating to hear that chronic stress decreases the volume of the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex in our brains, which affects memory, learning, and paying attention to tasks, but that it increases the volume of the amygdala, which controls emotion. Our next guest is Dr. Hasina Samji, an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. She received her PhD in infectious disease epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University, where she also completed a Master of Science degree. She studies healthcare access for underserved populations, including people living with HIV, people who use drugs, and children and youth. Dr. Samji leads the Youth Development Instrument, a study measuring predictors of positive youth well-being, mental health, and development in high school. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, she is also co-leading a provincial study to measure the mental health impacts of the pandemic on the children, youth, and caregivers. My name is Hasina Samji. I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. I also have affiliations with the BC Center for Disease Control, BC Children's Hospital, the Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addictions, and the Canadian HIV Trials Network. I'm a trained epidemiologist by profession, an infectious disease epidemiologist, um, and I study mental health and resilience at the population level and in special populations like young people and people living with HIV AIDS. Epidemiologists are essentially disease detectives. We study uh, causes of diseases and the distribution of disease in a population or in specific subpopulations. We're also interested in finding solutions at con and controlling disease um, in populations. So what inspired me to go into epidemiology? Well, in all honesty, I had never really heard of epidemiology until the end of my undergraduate career. Um, and even uh, I was not familiar with public health as a field um, or the career options within, within public health. I always knew I was interested in health and working with underserved or marginalized populations, certainly inspired by the work of the Aga Khan Development Network. Um, and my, I thought that my goal was to do a master's in, in international health. Um, and when an opportunity arose to go and volunteer um, at the Aga Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan, uh, I, I certainly took that opportunity and ended up spending about nine months in Karachi. Um, and it was a pivotal moment for me, certainly, um, getting to speak to some of the faculty members there uh, about my, my career plans and, and getting really incredible advice um, about finding skills that I could use both domestically and abroad. And, and they emphasize the importance of um, a skill set like epidemiology and doing both um, work um, in, in uh, the kinds of settings I was interested in um, abroad and, and, and that I could also use those skills um, back in Canada. And so I think that's one of the greatest misconceptions about mental health is that it's black and white. Someone is either mentally well or mentally ill and, and that's really not the case at all. And the other really important thing to note is that there are tools and strategies to improve our mental well-being just as we can improve our physical fitness through exercise. Um, and the other important thing to note is that 
people can have can develop skills um, and 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 then there are also structural supports that can support mental well-being and that's what I study among young people is trying to understand what are those individual skills and the supports around a young person that can lead to those positive trajectories and positive mental well-being for young people while there is convincing research that early adversity can have long-term impacts um, and, and not just in infectious diseases and incidents of higher incidence of uh, HIV, of mental illness and substance use, but also in other areas like increased risk of cancer, um, diabetes, and poor impacts on education, um, occupation, and employment. Um, again, referring to this really important area of prevention. We also know that focusing on the area of social and emotional learning can provide individual skills, individual level skills for young people to learn how to better cope and to uh, thrive, um, even in the context of adversity. So for those of you who are parents, hopefully you've heard of this term social emotional learning or SEL um, and, and the tremendous impact that SEL can have on your child's long-term education success and life success as well. SEL represents those non-cognitive, more soft skills, like being able to recognize your own emotions, being able to recognize emotions in others, and empathy, um, responsible decision-making, and, and critically, um, being able to form um, positive relationships with others. In addition to these SEL skills, there are also other important skills like grit and growth mindset. And these are, these are skills that I study um, in my survey of young people uh, called the Youth Development Instrument that studies well-being for grade 11 students or 16 year olds here in British Columbia. And in addition to these individual level skills, what's also, as we know, critically important is what are the supports and structures that surround young people that we know can lead to more positive trajectories or promote these positive trajectories and mental well-being. And, and some of those structural supports we know are you know, things like um, close attachment to parents, so that's critically important having close relationships with, with um, family members, um, but also thinking about um, access to healthcare, access to mental health supports uh, in case they're needed, um, and those are more structural level um, determinants. And, and certainly, um, you know, a child living in poverty would not necessarily have some of the, um, the, the things they need to thrive. The last research area I wanted to share is our work looking at the impacts of the pandemic on the population at large and within specific subpopulations that are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So news headlines have really been dominated by infections and hospitalizations. Um, these direct Im uh, impacts are certainly important to look at, but missing from the larger picture are the indirect impacts of the pandemic, including the mental health impacts. And emerging research is showing that some of the groups that have been disproportionately impacted are young people in school, so those that have been affected by these school closures and increasing isolation, um, young adults who are at a very sensitive stage where they're establishing careers, um, they've certainly been impacted tremendously. Um, young parents are another group that uh, have struggled um, in the pandemic. Um, and, and those with pre-existing mental illness. These are just some of the many groups uh, that, that have been disproportionately impacted. Um, and I think what's really important is, first of all, to measure the impacts at a population level, but also in these smaller subgroups, so that policies can be developed now to um, find better supports for these different groups. We know, we, we, you know, we know that there are going to be impacts now and in the long term by looking at the impacts of other you know, natural disasters and pandemics. So we can learn from, from what has happened in the past to prepare uh, for what we can anticipate now and later will be uh, what, what is being called a tsunami of, of mental illness uh, post pandemic. Well, what I love about epidemiology is that I'm able to work with teams of people. So we'll have biostatisticians on our team. I often have you know, students that I'm working with doing their graduate or undergraduate training. Um, and 
Typically, I get to work on many different projects with many different people, and so that's certainly an aspect I really enjoy as well. Um, the opportunity to potentially make a difference for, for populations is, is really appealing, and I think epidemiology, as well as the academic affiliation um, and being able to lead my own studies, gives me that potential to, to make a lasting impact. So what advice would I give to the younger generations? Um, what advice would I give to younger generations aspiring to careers in STEM or perhaps aspiring epidemiologists? Well, well certainly um, what I think is important is to talk to as many people as you can. If you have the opportunity to shadow people in areas uh, that you're interested in, who may be pursuing careers that you may be interested in, take those opportunities. You know, they can really inform your impression of, of what it is actually to, to practice um, in that particular um, uh, career. And it can also help you learn what, what you may not you know, appreciate about that particular career. For instance, as an academic, I spend a lot of time sitting at a desk, writing grants, in meetings. That may not be everyone's cup of tea. And, and so if you take that opportunity to learn from, from people who are doing your potentially dream job, um, you, you may find that actually it, it doesn't appeal, the lifestyle doesn't appeal. And that's important to know as early as possible. Um, and so doing internships, how I went to, to um, Pakistan and spent some time doing HIV research and, and you know, some community activities there really helped me to determine what my career trajectory should be and, and it continues to evolve. But certainly those life experiences where I was able to um, you know, communicate with people in different careers, uh, follow them, watch them and experience it for myself during my internship. Um, was really pivotal for my career trajectory and I would encourage young people to reach out to as many people as they can. The worst they can say is no um, and it's certainly worth the effort. How fascinating to hear that parental attachment in early life is really critical for the well-being of a child across its life course. So let's have supportive conversations with our children. The idea to quarantine the sick and impose citywide lockdowns to prevent the spread of an infectious disease was first introduced by the famous physician and philosopher scientist of the medieval age, Ibn Sina. During his time, tuberculosis and bubonic plagues regularly ravaged cities and countrysides. As detailed in the remarkable medical encyclopedia, The Canon of Medicine, Ibn Sina not only figured out that the diseases transmitted from person to person, but also came up with the idea of quarantines and lockdowns to control those spreads. Our next segment is on Islam and science. The notion that both body and soul belong to God and will ultimately return to Him is a fundamental belief in Islam. Accordingly, maintaining and strengthening one's physical and spiritual well-being becomes an ethical duty for each believer. In Muslim societies of the past, this ethical duty led to increased focus and efforts in the field of medicine, resulting in a greater understanding of the body, its various illnesses, and remedies for some of these conditions. By the 9th and 10th centuries, some of the best doctors were to be found in Muslim societies, none more prominent than Ibn Sina, also known as Avicenna in the West. Ibn Sina was born in 980 into an Ismaili family in the city of Bukhara where he spent his childhood. In his autobiography, Ibn Sina discussed some of his education, travels, interests, and quotes the influence his father had on his eagerness to learn. My father used to study and ponder over the Rasail Ikhwan al Safa, and I also pondered over it from time to time. As a child prodigy, Ibn Sina is said to have memorized the Holy Quran as a child, mastered all available knowledge to him by his teens, surpassing his teachers at a very young age. He turned to medicine at the age of 16 and completed his qualifications as a doctor at the age of 18. He soon gained prominence in Bukhara becoming the personal physician for the Samanid rulers and later for the Buyid rulers of Rai and Isfahan. 
In this time, Ibn Sina advocated for evidence-based medicine as he explored and documented new methods of treatment. He also composed some 200 books on philosophy and medicine, among other subjects. Of his many works, Al-Shifa, The Cure, and The Canon of Medicine had an important impact on the medical community, with the canon being translated into Hebrew, Latin, and Chinese, and its distribution being widespread. So much so that in 1913, the Canadian physician and professor of medicine, Sir William Osler, described Avicenna as the author of the most famous medical textbook ever written. Ibn Sina's contribution is believed to be pivotal in the foundations and growth of what we consider modern medicine in today's day and age. Our next segment covers an exciting weekly rundown of global news on emerging technology, scientific trends, and other extraordinary advancements. Narrated by artificial intelligence, these stories have been handpicked just for you. Researchers at Northwestern University have created a new robot that looks and behaves like a tiny aquatic animal. It can perform a variety of functions, including moving objects, catalyzing chemical reactions, delivering therapeutics, and more. It is made from a material composed of 90% water, with a nickel skeleton that changes shape in response to light and magnetic fields. When light hits the robot, the material expels water, causing the robot's legs to stiffen. The robots are currently the size of a dime, but future versions will be small enough to operate on a microscopic level. Drone Seed is a company that uses fleets of drones to reforest areas burned in wildfires. The Federal Aviation Administration has approved Drone Seed's heavy lift drones for operation beyond visual line of sight in several states. Drone Seed is now allowed to begin reforesting an area once a fire is contained and airspace is clear. A swarm of five drones can reseed 25 to 50 acres each day. The drones are designed to drop tree seeds in places where they have a decent chance of survival. An international team of scientists successfully treated 37 patients suffering from Leber hereditary optic neuropathy, a disease that causes optic nerve degeneration and rapid vision loss. This can cause people to become legally blind within a few weeks of disease onset. It affects 1 in 30,000 people, mostly men, starting in their 20s and 30s. A majority of patients carry a specific mutation, which the scientists targeted using a technique called mitochondrial targeting. While the treatment was only applied to one eye, both eyes improved for 78% of the patients. The scientists theorized that this was due to the transfer of viral vector DNA from the injected eye, which was confirmed later with experiments on macaques. The same technology can be used to treat other mitochondrial diseases. The first underwater roundabout will soon open below the Atlantic Ocean. It lies at the end of an 11 kilometers long tunnel which cuts the travel time between the two of the Faroe Islands down from more than an hour to just 16 minutes. With its jellyfish-shaped design, the roundabout is set to be a tourist attraction in its own right. Cars will be charged to toll for each one-way journey, or commuters can pay for a yearly subscription. Portal is a fully self-contained hologram machine that projects life-sized holograms in full color. It can be used to project a live image of a person anywhere in the world. An inbuilt camera allows the person in the hologram to view their audience, and it features a touchscreen so people can interact with the image. They are starting to appear worldwide in malls, airports, and museums. Each machine costs $60,000. A miniature version of the device will be released in the future. Thank you again for watching this week. As we have reached the end of the series, let's take a moment to thank all of the volunteers for their time, knowledge, dedication, and effort. Finally, let's hear what Malana Hazumam said at the foundation ceremony of the Aga Khan Academy in Dhaka in 2008. The Holy Quran sees the discovery of knowledge as a spiritual responsibility, enabling us better to understand and more ably serve 
Allah's creation. Our traditional teachings remind us of our individual obligation to seek knowledge until the ends of the earth and of our social obligation to honor and nurture the full potential of every human life.